Over a hundred years after the Douglas and Laxey Coast electric tramway opened for business, two of the original three power cars survive in regular service on today's Manx Electric Railway. Cars 1 and 2 returned from Gradle in parallel during 1993, the year that both the cars and this section of line celebrated their centenary. The birth of arguably the most ambitious British electric traction scheme to date was as a direct result of the increasing popularity of the Isle of Man. Traditionally, the island had been a regular summer residence for wealthy visitors, but from the 1880s, Douglas developed as the working classes arrived en masse. The seafront became an extended row of boarding houses served by a horse tramway. Number two returns to the depot to collect a trailer. The Manx electric car sheds lie on the site of Port Ivada Creek, the natural barrier at the north end of Douglas Promenade. Beyond here was 20 miles of unspoilt coastline with no railway. The island's railways were prospering, and by the 1880s, various steam routes were proposed up the east coast, but the terrain was far from ideal. It would be advances in electric traction that would open up this beautiful coastline. 102 years separate these two scenes. Port Ivado was bridged by the tramway contractors as work progressed alongside the Derby Castle Entertainment Complex. The promoters had formed the Douglas Bay Estate Limited to build the tramway and a road for access to the House Drake Estate, where a major development providing pleasure grounds and housing was proposed. The new power station and car sheds occupied reclaimed land, the site being dominated by the 60 foot. Upon completion, the Douglas and Laxey Coast Electric Tramway Company took over the two and a quarter mile line to Groudel a single track with two passing places. The new name reflected aspirations of an extension to Laxey, the company consisting primarily of subscribers to the original Douglas Bay Company. 500 volts DC passed through the overhead conductor wire, Dr. Edward Hopkinson employing his patented bow collector. This initially proved to be troublesome, the first car not reaching Groudel until the 26th of August 1893. Just 19 days of service preceded winter closure. On July the 28th, 1894, the railway reached Lexi Glen, just under seven miles from Derby Castle. Exactly a hundred years later, the anniversary was celebrated in fine style as the original car which inaugurated services, driven by Eric Farragher, son of the original motorman, reenacted the opening of the Lexi section. Number five approaches Balabeg. By July 1894, the company had purchased the Douglas horse trams and changed its name to the Isle of Man Tramways and Electric Power Company Limited to reflect a new business, the public supply of electricity. As this 1894 advertising suggests, further expansion was proposed, but electric trams along the promenade at Douglas would remain just a dream. The horse tramway was purchased for just £38,000, but by Act of 1876, it would transfer to the local authority in 1897. In an effort to extend the lease for another 21 years, Alexander Bruce, the driving force behind the electric railway, proposed to convert the horse tramway to double track, electrify it, and build the Upper Douglas Cable Tramway. He also requested the right to sell electricity to private consumers. Long drawn out negotiations resulted in payment of 15% of horse tram receipts to the local authority and the building of the cable tramway, which opened in August 1896. The previous year, the new company had reached the highest point on the Isle of Man with the purchase of the Snaefell Mountain Railway. Built to a gauge of three foot six inches rather than three feet, the Snaefell line featured a centre fell rail originally gripped by powerful caliper brakes during the descent. Previous fell railways also used the centre rail for additional adhesion when climbing, but with the advances in electric traction and the provision of Britain's most powerful tram cars to date, the 1 in 12 could be traditionally worked on the ascent. On the coast route, four vehicles were purchased to a similar design. 
These were all withdrawn from passenger service in 1902, number 12 emerging as a cattle vehicle the following year. The final section of the electric railway would open in 1899 with the arrival in Ramsey, a joint station in Laxey being commissioned in connection with the extension. By 1897, plans were already in hand, but first proposals favoured three termini in the village, from Douglas, Snaefell and Ramsey. Plans for the approach to Ramsey were changed too. At Port Lague, work was started on a sea level route. A sea wall for the promenade and two purpose-built boarding houses remain. The line was to hug the coast, running along a promenade before terminating near Ramsey Harbour. Unstable geology is thought to be the reason for abandonment. This bridge over Balur Glen is a mystery. Was it built by the tramway company or is its position on the route of the line coincidence? The railway eventually crossed the glen upstream. Until this structure was completed, a temporary terminus on the south side of the river had to suffice between the 2nd of August 1898 and the 24th of July 1899, when Ramsey proper was reached. In the summer of 1899, the four winter saloons entered service, bearing the name Douglas, Lexi and Ramsey Electric Tramway, celebrating the new extension. 22 power cars now graced the coast route. 1898 deliveries were 14 to 18. The unvestibuled crossbench opens. Although all five survive, number 14 is in store along with 1893 trailer number 53. In 1900, the company built locomotive 23 at Derby Castle. But dark clouds loomed. With the company financially overstretched, Dumbbell's Bank crashed in February that year. In July 1901 came liquidation, the horse and cable tramways being purchased by Douglas Corporation in September. A year later, a Manchester syndicate offered £250,000 for the three electric lines. The Manx Electric Railway, a new company, was incorporated in November 1902. 24 to 27, the MER's first new power cars were converted 1898 trailers. But in 1904, three new vehicles entered service built by the Electric Railway and Carriage Works Limited in Preston, whose successor, the United Electric Car Company Limited, supplied the last power cars, 32 and 33, in 1906. These are the most powerful vehicles in the fleet. The company generated its own electricity until 1935 when six substations were commissioned, served by the public supply. Mercury Arc rectifiers converted the AC supply. The Derby Castle example, now just a memory. The following sequences were recorded in the late 1950s and early 60s, the immediate post-nationalisation period of relative plenty. The railway had been busy, but profits diminished, then disappeared, until the old company was unable to continue. The only option had been nationalisation. The tightening of purse strings led to gradual decay, but the new era hailed a massive track renewal programme and the arrival of green paint. Car 29 in the despised nationalised livery was employed by the LRTA in 1961 for a short working to house drake. The newly appointed MER board of Tinwald had decided to replace the tradition, the first vehicle emerging on Christmas Eve 1957. By October 1958, the livery was abandoned, but not before the colours had been inflicted on nine MER power cars, three trailers and two Snaefell vehicles. Number one was another unfortunate paint shop victim. At Derby Castle, the impressive canopy over the horse tram terminus is just one of the lineside structures lost in relatively recent years. It was erected in the Electric Power Company era. Looking back at archive film, it's surprising how scenes have changed. Climbing past the Derby Castle entertainment complex is number two. For many years, the wire car. But during peak season, the demoted one and two would be resurrected from the maintenance fleet to work passenger services. Approaching Laxey with two tower wagons is Ratchet Car 17. 
Last serviced in 1957, it has been in store in semi-derelict condition for some years, although its bogies powered the 1993 outings of Locomotive 23. Alongside the goods shed is a tunnel car, whilst another of the batch calls at the station. From 1966, the front window pillar in these cars was cut through to improve visibility for the motorman. Number 21 sports the post-green era of nationalised livery with a pleasant return of red and traditional lining. The 1950s had seen austerity liveries devoid of lining and in an effort to save costs, the company name was shortened to just M.E.R. Number 20 is passed on the approach to Doom Quarry. These views from 1961 illustrate the site before it was tidied up. Railborne traffic from the quarries had ceased in the 1930s, the sidings becoming a graveyard for surplus wagons. We continue towards Ramsey. With the exception of the two world wars, the MER was carrying approximately 470 to 570,000 passengers each year. In 1946, the post-war boom of tourism on the island provided one and a half million passengers but it proved to be an Indian summer. From 1951, visitor numbers plummeted with the inevitable reduction in revenue for the railway. Four years later, the unsuccessful bid to curtail winter services preceded a letter to Tinwald in December 1955. The financial state of the railway was desperate, the company stating that they could no longer continue to operate after the 30th of September 1956 but they were willing to sell the line, excluding hotels, for £70,000. These were the circumstances preceding nationalisation, the government acquiring the railway for a bargain £50,000, approximately the scrap value. Two reports were commissioned. One involved three specialists from British Railways London Midland region who advised complete replacement over a 16-year period. £674,000 was quoted. The bus companies readied themselves for the certain demise. Thankfully, another report was more favourable, coming from two tramway experts whose opinion was that the railway's intrinsic worth was incalculable. Car 21 departs Ramsey for Laxey, where number 33 arrives from Douglas in August 1967. Investment had started to dry up. The replacement of the railway's lorries, based at Douglas and Ramsey, was thought to be uneconomic. And with the Isle of Man road services unwilling to offer a connecting service, the MER goods operation was withdrawn on the 1st of April 1966, although wagons were still used to carry the mail or for station-to-station -station deliveries. 1966 had also seen the release of a report on public transport commissioned by the government. Closure of the Laxey to Ramsey line was proposed. On the 20th of January 1967, an incident at Bulgan Bay could so easily have resulted in just that. The seaward wall of the embankment collapsed. The line was severed. But investment was forthcoming, and from July the 10th, normal services were resumed. In Douglas, the corporation had purchased the Derby Castle Entertainment Complex for development as Summerland, a swimming pool and solarium, claiming that the horse and electric trams serving it were incongruous. Initial plans suggested expulsion for the MER car sheds to Onken Head. Reputedly, surveyors were found measuring up the yard without permission. Intermediate plans included a tunnel for the railway behind the building. Summerland is under construction in these 1968 views. The Manx Electric survived the 1970s, an escape worthy of Houdini. For some members of Tinwald, largely representing constituencies away from the railway, were constantly pressing for closure. In 1971, a new company on the island, Rapid Transit Technical Services Limited, was seeking to operate the electric railways under a lease arrangement. Mike Goodwin proposing to once again make the Manx Electric viable. Among the RTTS proposals were the establishment of a joint MER and Snaefell workshop in Laxey, rationalisation of current stock and the modification of saloons for one-man operation. 
right-hand running would be adopted to facilitate economic conversion. The Lexi to Ramsey line would be converted to a single track route with long loops. The offer was not accepted, commissioning Transmark British Rails consultants to advise and report. In retrospect, BR's track record in the 1970s was appalling, and perhaps they were the last consultants required. On the 7th of February 1973, the report was presented to the MER board. Complete winter closure of the system and permanent closure north of Lexi was favoured. Armed with his camera, John Smallwood decided to record the last days of the Ramsey Line, or so it seemed. These scenes on the approach to Bulgum were recorded between the 22nd and the 26th of August 1975. In just five weeks, the entire Isle of Man railways would be silent for the first time in 102 years. The service of three substitute buses a day would soon have to suffice. It had not been the Transmark report that had closed the line, but it had started the ball rolling. A House of Keys steering committee, considering government control of the remaining transport systems, had also concluded that the Ramsey line had to go. And so did the mail contract. With no winter service, the post office pulled out. The nationalisation of the steam railway in January 1978 resulted in Isle of Man Railways transfers. Service car 2 hauled 23 to Laxey in 1979, before restored number 1 passes Laxey car sheds. Repaints were commissioned in conjunction with the Millennium of Tinwald celebrations. On number 32, green was back in vogue. The closure of the Ramsey line resulted in mass support for the railway, the MER becoming one of subjects in the 1976 general election. When nearly half of the House of Keys was not re-elected, the people's wish for a complete railway became apparent. On the 25th, 19th, the railway was once again whole. Car 6 descends to Derby Castle before one of the winter saloons departs for Laxey. The soon-to-be-lost canopy over the horse tram terminus still stands, but Summerland is a burnt-out shell, a reminder of the tragic fire in 1973. In 1980, winter services were resumed, and the already nationalised bus services were brought under the same management as the railway. Today, the operation of the railway and bus services is under the Department of Tourism and Transport. The genuine realisation of the railway's attraction for visitors was proven beyond doubt with the staggeringly successful 1993 Year of Railways. Transport executive Robert Smith and his team, in particular coordinator Alan Corlett, made 1993 a year to remember. The Manx Electric was celebrating its 100th birthday in style, with historic liveries to the fore and events by the score. Fitted with over 1,600 bulbs, Car 9 became the island's first illuminated tram car. Other events included a centenary run, one and two in parallel, motorman lessons, double-headed steam on the Port Erin line, and steam on the Manx Electric from Laxey to Doon Quarry. Loch departs Laxey with the MER's two Preston-built 1904 trailers. Railways brought approximately 25,000 visitors to the island, a shot in the arm for the recent lacklustre years of Manx tourism. But away from the phenomenal weeks of activity, it was business as usual on the MER. We start our journey to Ramsey at the Derby Castle car sheds in 1995. These buildings date primarily from 1894 to 96, although the far line was not covered until 1924. The original three-road car shed is also still in use. Alongside is the site of the boiler room demolished by the MER, a goods shed being built on the site. 
the building has since become a paint shop. The two original Galloway boilers were supplemented by a third for the push towards Laxey. Behind the boiler room was the engine house where 90 horsepower vertical compound engines drove Mather and Platt and Hopkinson generators. Today's machine shop and rectifier room once housed the engines. A plaque marked the upgrade of the plant which operated until 1903 when the switch gear was moved to a new elevated position in the former engine room as Douglas became a substation served with AC power from Lexi. In 1980, solid-state equipment replaced the 1934 Mercury Arc rectifier seen in our archive sequences, which had itself replaced the original rotary converters. The maintenance bay still serves its original purpose. The fell brake fitted MER trailer, the new Mariah, and the illuminated car giving a Snaefell flavor. In 1993, a winter saloon emerges from the car shed with an 1899 trailer. MER supervisor John Matthews makes use of the convenient departing tram for an internal delivery. The car sports the Douglas Laxey and Ramsey electric railway livery applied around the turn of the century, in the final days of the electric power company. The rail title had replaced tramway, which the saloons had previously carried. It had been the centenary of electric traction in 1979, which heralded the new era of historic liveries. The centenary celebrated was the opening of the Siemens and Halske line in Berlin, which is widely regarded as the world's first electric railway. By 1995, number 21 was in full Manx electric livery, as motorman Mike Goodwin steps aboard ready to take us the full 17 and three quarter miles to Royal Ramsey. Okey-dokey. Um, by selecting the first notch on the controller, the earth and the power from the trolley wire are connected to the resistance circuit, the car starting away when the brakes are released. At this stage, the four motors are connected in series. The rheostat, or resistance, progressively cut out with each notch until the motorman selects notch five, or top series, where there is no resistance. In series, the four motors share the available voltage. One and two are in the Douglas end bogey. Approximately half maximum speed is attainable in series. To increase speed, the motorman engages a shunt transition to the first of four parallel notches, and the motors are paired, one and three, two and four. Each takes half-line voltage. The top series and top parallel notches are used for sustained running. All others are rear stat positions. Whilst in one of these, the car is not running at its most economic, the power used by the rear stat being dissipated as heat. By the time a car is passing the car sheds, the motors are working in parallel. Inside the Derby Castle substation, every notch on the controller is reflected as the car climbs at about 1 in 20. Power for the sub comes direct from the Manx Electricity Authority, although in 1935, when it opened, the public supply came underground via the MER's Laxey sub. Douglas did have an emergency supply available, and it was this direct feed that was adapted in the 1980s. Car 22 rounds Port Jack. Inside of this sharp curve was the Douglas Bay Hotel. In 1894, it was the first customer for electricity from the Isle of Man Tramways and Electric Power Company. Destroyed by fire in the late 1980s, the site is now a wasteland. We're now running alongside King Edward Road in Onken. Before the turn of the century, some of the streets in the village and near Derby Castle were already lit by the railway using 15 amp arc lights of approximately eight candle power. Douglas was a modern resort and the installation of electric lighting before much of the mainland enhanced its image, as did a state-of-the-art electric railway. Car 20 passes Onken Station non-stop. Onken had contrasting attractions, 
a round of golf for the easygoing, or for the more energetic, a ride on a big dipper. Mike Goodwin. Over on the right here, you used to have a thing called White City, which was a sort of giant amusement park. Leastwise, it was giant sized by the scale of things in the island. It brought a lot of business to this line. Even I remember the days where there was something like a sort of four minute headway out of Douglas there, with short working cars going as far as, say, Garwick, Crowdle, or the odd one to do one can head only. Um, because you did get a, a build up of people there, and it was so that was the place where they had a sort of uh, automatic it machine to ticket all the people very quickly. It was a sort of the sort of thing you'd see at a cinema uh, cash desk. To that extent, I think it was almost unique in tramway practice. Nobody had ever heard of such a machine. Before the railway was built, this was just an exposed headland, opened up by the railway and its associated road. The original company never made any real attempt to uh, develop any uh, sort of real estate on the surrounds of it. Um, what you're seeing here is all really either uh, started, I would think, in the late 1920s, but the vast bulk of it has been built in my time. This is all sort of 1950s, 1960s property, except on the right here, if you've got certain properties uh, that really date back to probably just after the turn of the century, but they were not the sort of properties where their beneficial owners would have uh, become tram car passengers. The plan to build the road in the foreground was promoted in 1889 by Alexander Bruce, general manager of Dumbbells Bank, and Frederick Saunderson, a civil engineer. By 1891, Alfred Jones Lusty, a wealthy London merchant and resident of Howstrick Mansion, joined the scheme, and soon Bruce enlisted the services of Dr. Edward Hopkinson of Mather and Platt, whose experience in the field of electric traction was considerable. Plans for the Axis Road now included a tramway, and soon the Isle of Man became a proving ground for the world's electric traction industry. Looking back across Onken Harbour, Douglas Promenade is approximately two miles away. The MER journey is one and a quarter miles to this headland, but in that distance the line has climbed 100 feet. Motorman Jack Cubbon is in charge of the 2 p.m. from Douglas. Winter Saloon number 19, Hall's Box Van 11. In the van, on this occasion, are two exhaust pipes for a Ramsey garage. Station to station delivery of goods is still a feature of MER life. Exhaust pipes to Ramsey are regular traffic, travelling for just a pound each at 1995 prices. We're now approaching the abandoned site of House Street Holiday Camp. How straight camp must have produced, I don't know, 20, 30, 40,000 customers a year for this line. There always seemed to be an ongoing dispute as to the necessity of a late night car to bring their uh, reveling camp residents back to the camp after uh, closing time. It was tied up with the great and well known Cunningham's camp in Douglas here, um, and it was very, very busy indeed. It, it actually closed just on about 20 years ago. Um, if I remember correctly, it was still in business in 73 and 1974. Um, I have an idea they had a fire. The ornamental entrance to House Drake Park is on the left, literally at the summit of the first section of the line, 258 feet above sea level. For many years, the road was unmade, road traffic being less common than tram cars. On the other side of the road, another ornamental gateway gave access to the camp. But visitors using the main entrance would use an underground access tunnel beneath the railway. The camp was positioned in a glorious location above Port Groudel with views out to Clay Head and of course the Groudel Glen Railway. The buildings that remain are from the last era. Enter here for the 18-hole golf course, one of the many attractions offered by House Drake Holiday Camp for ladies and gentlemen. By the 1930s, accommodation for ladies was bungalows, but the gentlemen might find themselves in semi-canvas bungalows or tents. 
the illuminated tramcar approaches by nature a nocturnal creature. It was selected as motive power for the test run of rebuilt trailer number 56. The former crossbench vehicle retained no clear story roof and bulkheads, the rebuild involving the addition of saloon sides and major strengthening. Internally, demountable revolving seats are installed and a wheelchair lift has been fitted in the Ramsey end. At last, disabled passengers can ride on the MER. Housedrake Holiday Camp was built by the Douglas Bay Estate and Browdle Glen Limited, who in effect bought back the 50-acre Housedrake Park from the Douglas and Laxey Coast Electric Tramway Company, who had purchased the park from their predecessors, the Douglas Bay Estates Limited, along with the completed tramway from Douglas to Baldroma Beck, one and a quarter miles beyond Groundle. As such, the tramway company purchased a ready-built line from its nominally independent sister company. Douglas Bay Estates Limited built the tramway to Groundle largely on land purchased from the Housedrake Estate. But to gain access to Groudle Glen, an agreement was required with Lessee RM Broadbent. The first section of tramway was barely under construction when it became apparent that Alexander Bruce had his sights set on Lexi. And soon further agreements increased Housedrake Estate land to Baldroma Beg. From there, a new act of tin wall would be required to enable compulsory land purchase for the extension to Lexi. Groudel Lane was once the only access to this part of the coastline. Car 3, actually Car 2 in disguise, hauls 1893 trailer number 13. Canopies were fitted to the original trailers for the first full season. We're now nearing Groudel, very often the first stop. Many first-time passengers are surprised by the simple cab layout in particular the lack of a speedometer. You don't need a speedo with a, a tram car. You should be able to tell fairly closely, in fact, very closely, what speed the thing is doing. Um, each of the rails on this line is 30 or 31 foot 6 long. And therefore, if you count the number of rail joints you go over in 10 seconds, multiply that by 2, that will give you your miles per hour to a very, very close tolerance indeed. Um, we have actually checked that against a, a road motor vehicle with a calibrated speedo, and it does work very, very well indeed. I think the, the constant is 0.682 times the length of the rail in feet. Groudel was the terminus of the line for just over three operational months, until the opening to July 1894. Initially, just a single track served the terminus, the first public service arriving on the 7th of September, 1893, an event commemorated 100 years later. The original station building survives. Opposite is the entrance to the Glen, where RM Broadbent developed a series of walks and in 1896 opened one of Britain's first pleasure railways, the Groudel Glen Railway. Sea Lion crosses the original Lexi Road en route from Len Cuan to Sea Lion Rocks. Strangely, Graudel means gloomy day, but gloom is not something that you would associate with a trip to this glen, where a miniature zoo refreshment rooms, dance floors, a hotel, and at night, a myriad of colored lamps transformed it into a fairyland. By July 1894, 78,000 visitors were arriving at Groudel each week on the new electric tramway. The Groudel River had temporarily delayed progress until contractor Mark Kering bridged the glen. Between the station and the viaduct is Groudel Sub now served direct from the public supply. In 1894, a battery house was set up here to eliminate the risk of overload in one of the three Douglas generators, as two cars made uphill starts simultaneously. The 240 cells were charged once or twice a week. 
Reliving those pioneering days, this is the centenary run celebrating the opening of the gravel to Laxey section. Car 5 passes over the viaduct. Our cameraman is standing on the site of the former House Drake Estate Toll House, active until the 1920s. Demolished in the late 1980s, it once guarded iron gates across the road. For the extension to Lexi, six new cars were supplied, featuring enclosed cabs ready for the first year of winter services. The short 1893 season had been a trial period. The reopening on Whit Saturday, 1894, beginning an era of unbroken service, lasting until the winter of 1975. After a brief level section, the line climbs the Len Kuen Valley towards Halfway House Crossing. Although most of the railway's revenue comes from the relatively short summer season, it should not be forgotten that the MER provides a service throughout the year. Motormen very often know which day regular passengers catch a tram to Douglas, Laxey or Ramsey to do their shopping, and can predict a stop in what seems to be the most unlikely location. They are also kept informed by their conductor, busy inside the car checking and selling tickets, any non-compulsory stops being relayed to the motorman. Well, Drine itself was a fairly busy spot. Um, I don't know what, when that started getting developed residentially, but it certainly did pick up quite a lot of traffic. And for many years there was in fact a bag of mail brought out of Douglas in the days when we had the Royal Mail contract. And the local post lady uh, for Baldrine would collect that bag of mail off the car and then sort it out and deliver it in that area. Altogether there was, I think, eight uh, boxes that we had the keys to. Each of the conductors on the cars was sworn in as an auxiliary postman and therefore had the key and access to the pillar boxes along the line. And four times a day, uh, you'd stop the car and open the pillar box, empty it of what it got in, put it in the sack, and away it went down to Douglas. And it was a most cost-effective and efficient means of uh, collecting and transmitting the mail. The mail was always picked up by cars on regular service, although no additional time was added to the timetable. The boxes were at Onken, Majestic, Groudel, Halfway House, Baldrine, Laxey, Glenmona, Balajora and Bellevue. There was also a collection from a private letterbox inside the Snaefell Summit Hotel. The arrangements with the post office began in 1894. Later, the extension to Ramsey relieved the Manx Northern Railway of its Douglas Ramsey postal duties. The contract varied over the years, but with the introduction of the 1972 winter timetable, the MER lost the contract for collection from the five most southerly boxes. The duty was terminated completely on the 30th of September 1975, with the winter closure of the whole system. Douglas to Laxey Road will draw in from our left. The main road, former Toll Road and meet at Halfway House Crossing or Baldroma Beg. This is also the point where the MER meets the erstwhile proposed routes of other East Coast railways. From the early 1880s, East Coast routes were regularly proposed, but the undulating landscape left it devoid of lines until 1893. The electric tramway was unique in choosing a coastal route from Douglas, others planning to serve the centre of Onken. Beyond Halfway House, remarkable similarities occur between schemes, leading to the conclusion that the survey of George Noble Fell was used as the basis for Frederick Saunderson's route for the electric line to Laxey. Coming right up now to the, the boundary of the Douglas, and uh, from here on, this is, this is the section that's actually shown on the um, was it the 1894 Act, uh, the extension through to Laxey? Because up till there it was totally private ground. The whole 
idea or the notion, the concept of having a tramway between Douglas and Groudle Glen was in itself one of the mysteries of all time. They presumably realised that they were finishing up in the middle of nowhere. And apart from the existence of the Groudle Glen Hotel as a terminal purpose, there was obviously a crying need for transportation of a reliable sort up this um, eastern coast of the island. You could argue that by 1873, when the first steam railway line opened in this island, almost every man and his dog by that stage had a narrow gauge steam railway. What was very, very surprising on a world scale was that 20 years later you had something like this in the Isle of Man. As pioneers, the tramway company suffered, for although blessed with top men in the field, electric traction was in its infancy and was constantly being improved. Current collection difficulties had led to modifications to the original bow collectors by brothers John and Edward Hopkinson. Early car deliveries were modified steam tram trailer designs. G. F. Milnes of Birkenhead was the successor of Starbuck. Early bogies or trucks were particularly primitive, and although many of the plate frame examples are still used, the everyday workhorses of the fleet, the winter saloons, have been fitted with smooth riding brill trucks from the early days of the Manx Electric Company. Remember, about 45% of... Um, of all your mileage on this line is actually carried out with the controller off altogether. A, a rail vehicle will coast for a very, very long way. And if you declared a general average, I suppose about 40%, 45% of the mileage is done just coasting. See, now you start to drop down to Garwick, and all she needs is three points of, points of power, and then she'll just coast all the way down this lot. From Baldrine, we descend at 1 in 25 towards Garwick. The original Glen station was positioned just beyond this road crossing, and Pointwick was installed to the north to enable short working from Douglas. Garwick Glen rivaled Groudle in popularity, the Manx Electric proclaiming itself as Manxland's scenic electric railway. At the very forefront of the publicity were the Glens, Groudle, Garwick, Laxey, Doon, Glenmona and Balaglass. Some remained unspoilt, whereas others became very commercialised. The Glens as a whole were enormous businesses in their own right. As far as the, the, the MER was concerned, they, 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 they did do a sort of major promotion for most of the Glens that lay along the route of the line. Um, but there was a, always a special emphasis on Groudle and on Garwick, uh, which originally belonged to the same company, uh, which in itself was allied with what became the Manx Electric Railway. The other one that they made a special effort with, um, and which they owned themselves, uh, was Ballaglass. But you had a whole series of others like Dune and Glen Mona and whatnot. Um, all very, very nice little places to visit. But Garwick was developed quite nicely. It had smugglers' caves and a lily pond and a maze and goodness knows what. But this station used to see better than 100,000 customers a year. And now if we get six, we're doing very, very well. Strangely enough, last year, I think it was, the uh, owners of Garwick House down in the Glen there, it's now a private residence, um, but they opened the gardens to the public for the first time in many, many years, and equally for the first time in many, many years, we had a genuine queue of customers waiting in Garwick Station there, and I found that eminently satisfying. During night car 26 hauls Isle of Man crane number three. The crane was used from 1928 
on a 240 foot long standard gauge line on the dock in Lexi. It was re-gauged to three feet for use on the steam railway. Riding on the rear is Steve Carter, who led the remarkable five month restoration. As the ensemble continues to Lexi, the chasing lineside bus is parked on the right. Beyond Balagorn Crossing, former Douglas Southern Electric Tramway traction poles are identifiable by collars. These are scattered throughout the system and, unlike the originals, have suffered little corrosion despite 99 years in the Manx Sea air. We are now riding on perhaps the best permanent way on the route. This short section was relayed in 1960. Elastic spikes were used with the rails laid on rubber pads. Halcyon days for the permanent way. There's hardly a quarter of a mile of this line in all these 17 and three miles that is both straight and level. You've got bits that are straight but they aren't level and you've got bits that are level but they aren't straight. And uh, for sheer curvature and gradient, this line has no equal. It's a very good training ground because I maintain anybody that can drive consistently and safely on this line in all the weathers, and remember again, you can have all the four seasons of the year all in the same trip here. Um, you really shouldn't have any difficulty at all learning anybody else's route. Just before Balabeg, the railway crosses the A2 Douglas to Ramsey Road. It actually passes over this road on five occasions, three of which are protected by flashing lights, advising road users of the imminent arrival of a tram. As you approach the crossing itself, uh, your wheels hit a little treadle switch, and uh, that starts the sequence, six seconds of amber, followed by the red flashing light. They don't necessarily take any notice of it as far as the road user's concerned, but it, it helps. For the descent into Lexi, Mike will use the air brake. In the foreground is the handbrake, primarily used when parking the car, but not exclusively. If I mount on, say, 32 or 33, something like that, that has got a beautiful handbrake, it's beautifully set up, um, I'll rarely, if ever, touch the, the air brake, simply because, I mean, the bottom line is you're here to provide a service to folk, um, but my reckoning, they're paying a level of fare that dictates that you jolly well give them the best quality ride you can. A handbrake is so nice insofar as you can feel exactly what you're doing to a car with the palm of your hand. There's no power form of power brake that has yet been invented that tells the motorman what he's going to get before he nibbles it and sees. Uh, whereas you'll never ever jerk a car um, or snatch the passengers um, with a handbrake because you haven't the physical strength. It's very, very gentle and very, very graduated. It's particularly ideal if you're on very, very greasy or icy rails as well because if you try to brake um, under circumstances as acute as that, uh, you can lock the wheels solid and you start skidding right away. If you try with the handbrake, you'll never get into a mess like that. So yes, I, uh, given a choice, if I'm feeling particularly active, I will drive on the handbrake. Having crossed Lamb's Crossing, number 19 continues the steady descent past Fairy Cottage. From here, a wooded ravine leads to the sea. From Balabeg to South Cape, the line drops 150 feet in just over one mile. Grades are at steepest one in 25. On the descent are three level crossings. We're now approaching Preston's Crossing. No accommodation is provided, but this is an occasional stop. On the hillside ahead is the course of the railway beyond Lexi. The line follows the contours through Old Lexi before diverging along Lexi Glen for the final approach to the center of the village. Just below the railway at this point is Lexi Harbor and the beach famous for its miracle cure toid arthritis. A Manchester man, paralysed in his lower limbs, sampled the local seaweed rubbing techniques and, after some time, ended up walking to Douglas and back. At least, that's what a 1930s guide to the Manx Electric claimed. 
South Cape is the stop for miracle cures? Possibly. But it is definitely the gateway to a very attractive part of the village. But to see it, you will have to descend a zigzag path. to Frida, she's one of our regular customers. The minimum radius of the line is around 90 feet. When entering a curve such as this, the motorman cannot see the exit. But up on the traction poles, there is assistance. On certain blind corners, there's what's known as curve boards. Now, the first one you come to is painted red, and the next one you come to after the curve is over is a white one. And the book says that you, under no circumstances, bring a car to a stop in that area. You draw yourself clear of it before you stop. If something hideous happened, like you fell off the lines, um, you must at once send your conductor or somebody back with the red flag to stop any following traffic. Uh, it's not that significant these days, but in the days where there was literally a two and a half minute headway between cars, uh, you, you had to know in good time, um, and so you flagged back right away. You still would, actually. I mean, the book still says that, that those are the things you do, so you jolly well do them. We're now nearing Laxey Karshev. The present depot dates from 1930, when the 1903 original was burnt to the ground. On the night of the 5th of April, flames up to 55 feet high engulfed the building. Casualties were cars 3, 4, 8 and 24, seven trailers, all three tower wagons and a mail van. It's thought that one of the cars contained a burning cigarette. Sadly, the insurance money only covered the replacement of the building and the purchase of three trailer bodies. There's John substation attendant. We've just passed over Rensel Road. The original 1894 station was just short of today's underbridge. This is the site of the 1896 station. The cattle dock was to the left. The viaduct crosses the Glenroy River. Like the one at Groudel, it was built by Mark Kerin. Laxey Station is in idyllic surroundings. Here, passengers from Douglas can alight to join a Snaefell tram for the trip to the summit, break their journey to visit such delights as the Laxey Wheel, the Lady Isabella, or just continue towards Ramsey. At the hub of the system, we alight for a brief look at the Manx Electric in the village. The original terminus was situated opposite today's car sheds. Douglas Power Station was unable to serve the extended route alone, and Laxey was chosen for a second power plant. Its new 135 and a half foot chimney illustrated in 1922. Within 13 years, the plant would be redundant as the MER abandoned electricity generation. The power station was situated on the south side of the Laxey River, the water once serving the boilers. South Wales coal for the plant was landed at Laxey Harbour, but the proposed isolated branch line to ease delivery was never built. Originally, two engines and improved dynamos served two feeder cables to the railway. By 1902, the plant was virtually obsolete. Elsewhere, AC generation and distribution had superseded the DC era. Laxey was chosen as the hub of a new AC system, Two Bellis and Morecambe 400 horsepower engines were installed and Douglas became a sub. The 20s upgrade included the building of this bridge, carrying broad and narrow gauge lines for coal and ash. Behind the power station are remains of the water race. The river was diverted by a weir to serve a turbine house 1,100 feet downstream of the power plant. A flow regulating device behind the plant returned excess water to the river. From the end of the water race, a headbox and settling tank preceded an 820-foot pipeline to the two 70-horsepower turbines. The 1899 development would enable the shutdown of the steam power plant for long periods in the winter. 
beyond the turbine house, a 620-foot tail race carried the water to the harbour. During a storm in September 1930, the whole of Lexi Glen flooded after debris accumulated behind the weir, a financial disaster for the company. A purpose-built substation near the site of the original terminus in Lexi was one of six which replaced the company's steam-powered generating plants. In November 1934, an agreement was reached with the Isle of Man Electricity Board. From that time, Transformers stepped down the public supply from 33 kC to 550 volts. Hewittic mercury arc rectifiers convert the voltage to DC for distribution to tram cars. The current is rectified in a high vacuum bulb by electronic emission from the hot spot on the cathode, the pool of mercury. The graphite anodes are kept cool by a fan which reflects activity in the bulb and, as such, movements out on the line. A car is pulling away. The mercury reaches 3,000 degrees centigrade, the bulb acting as a condensing chamber for the vapor. Much of the switchgear is reused 1904 apparatus. Laxey supplies DC power to the trolley and feeder wires on the Douglas, Snaefell and Ramsey lines, whilst the mountain substation is served with AC. Outside the substation, this is believed to be the former 1896 station. Laxey Depot permanent way car number 27 passes the substation. Actually an open platform car, it received homemade cab sides and windscreens to protect the motorman and P-Way staff during the winter. Originally fitted with Milne's bogies, this class received the wider brush trucks from 1903, necessitating wider footboards to clear the axle boxes, hence the name paddle boxes. In the station, the short-lived Bonner road rail wagons await departure. They were new in 1899, the same year as Lexi's refreshment room, which was sadly destroyed by fire in 1917. Today's station building is actually the recited 1897 Lexi terminus for the Snaefell line. The rustic style for the company's buildings was standard. Between the arrival from Douglas in 1894 and opening of this joint interchange, officially Lexi Junction, for the summer of 1898, at least three cross laxi schemes were proposed. The most bizarre included a deep cutting, a tunnel with a girder roof, and a hard climb to the second Snaefell station, which would become an interchange. We join a Ramsey service. On the right is the goods shed. The second Snaefell line terminus was once on the left. The site of the station track work is now partially buried under an enlarged embankment beside the Snaefell pointwork. The building was positioned between the wider gauge mountain line diverging left and the coastal route on the approach to this crossing. A Snaefell car approaches Laxey. The siding on the left was installed to facilitate lock in 1993. The building on the corner was formerly the Isle of Man Road Services bus garage. Once a siding alongside was used to extract mine spoil. We've just passed over a former railway tunnel. A 19-inch gauge railway linked the Great Laxey Mine's main adit and the washing floors. Laxey's principal industry was mining until 1929. When I was a small kid, there were still great heaps of stones. Uh, it was the mine spoil uh, that had come out of the lead and silver mines here. Now, long before I was thought of, the, the mountains of stone were even higher. And they hauled millions of tons away during the war to build the likes of Faria Andreas and RF Jerby. Um, most of it actually went out along the MER. And, um, it was transshipped to road vehicles once it got through to Ramsey. Now this, this, in, this little curve here was actually called Little Egypt Corner because for many years there were apparently three huge heaps of stones alongside in the valley there um, and it must have reminded somebody of uh, the three pyramids at Giza in Egypt 
and so that was what its name was. Most of these localities have a, a little name of their own. I mean, this the curve ahead now is is always known as um, Pen Corner. Heaven alone knows why. I've never remembered a hen or a pen or anything else around here. But it's just called Hen Pen Corner. I mean, completely crackers. Car 21 starts to climb on the approach to Minorca. is nomadic, formerly serving at Halfway House near Graudel. Menorca is a regular stop, uh, summer and winter alike. Um, there's a, a small nucleus of people. The more north you go, the more it seems that uh, this thing still fulfills its original transport function or its utility. Um, and that tells its own story during the winter because most of the winter traffic is concentrated between here and Ramsey, not down in Douglas. The fact that Derby Castle is over a mile from the centre of Douglas no doubt discourages locals from nipping into town. It seems that Bruce's plan to electrify the horse tram route and even extend to the steam railway station still holds weight. And Mike was certainly in favour of the resurrection of the scheme for 1993. Better a hundred years late than not at all. Mike's interest in the railway began in 1949. He is now chairman of the Manx Electric Railway Society. Gradient is more or less uniform. It's one in 24, uh, all the way from, uh, really, just before Henpen Corner, right the way through now till we get to the top of the Larrow. About three and a quarter miles climb, and in that time you'll have lifted a car 460 feet. Because our summit is 500 and used to be 588 feet until they remeasured everything in the island and it all became two feet higher, including Snaefell, and so it's presumably now 590 feet above the sea. There's a long, slow grind up here. If you actually physically stop the car and walk along this for a quarter of a mile, you realise how hard you are actually climbing. This is one of the first exposed stretches of the northern section. The climb to Balarak and Bolgum being notorious and certainly encouraging the use of saloons. The problems arise for the Douglas crews who may depart in fine weather, but by the time they are returning from Ramsey over two hours later, things could be nasty. And taking that open car might not have been such a good idea after all. Anything that's not nailed down or tied down tends to take off. Because it tends to blow right under that door there. It's, um, it's, it's railroading in the raw, you might say. And it certainly gets raw. Although this particular car is, is ideal for the winter service because as she is usually used during that period, because it's always a very warm inside there for the uh, customers. The winter saloons have always been well appointed although the partitions may not be original. The upholstered reversible seats were a 1930s addition. Garwick Bay, Laxey Bay and Clay Head are in the distance as a complete 1899 partnership of car 21 and trailer 45 with a climb. During 1993, the railway introduced a promotion in which anybody could drive a tram car. This was repeated for the Snaefell centenary year. This section of line is often used, the termination of some services from Douglas in Laxey making this part of the route less congested. Needless to say, no passengers travel on the training runs. Invariably, United Electric cars 32 or 33 are used, or perhaps even better, the paddle boxes. 
the added advantage of wider footboards being a particularly useful feature for the instructor, who rides on the outside of the car, on the side or the front. Mike was one of the instructors. Well, basically every car we have uh, has a, exactly the same controller. It's a K11, K, yeah, K11C uh, of dear old Mr. General Electric uh, of America. During 1904, the infant MER reallocated better equipment to the more heavily used cars. The winter saloons received Brill trucks from the 28 to 31 class to replace Milne's bogies. The crossbench cars also donated their Christensen air brake equipment. That gauge simply shows you what the pressure is down in the air tank. Um, now, there's an automatic governor system which will switch in the compressor when it gets down to about 60, 65, and it'll pump it up to about 110 and cut out. So the pressure will always be maintained somewhere in that area. Um, you actually only need about 30 pounds per square inch for effective braking because the size of the brake cylinder on these cars is so big that, frankly, you only need 5 to 10 pounds per square inch down in that cylinder to bring this car and a trailer and three tons of passengers all to a beautiful stop. The air and hand brakes are supplemented by a third braking method. But it is never used, for its efficiency is such that the application could do untold harm to passengers. The controller key to the right of the controller handle is ordinarily only used to select forward, off or reverse. For much of the year, the winter saloons have a virtual monopoly to Ramsey. The simple truth is they were the biggest saloon cars they ever bought. They all seat 48 people. Um, they've, they've simply no other cars that have that capacity. Um, plus the fact that they, they are generally kept in fairly, well, highly serviceable condition. Um, so they just hammer up and down this line day in, day out, as they have done ever since they were built. Um, it, you know, each of these cars has now done just over the four million revenue mile mark. And um, there's, there's really nothing what an electric tram car would give you mileage like that with so little trouble. But we could very usefully use a couple of fairly modern one-man operated saloon cars, especially for the winter service and for the evening service during the summer. Because everything these days is dictated by the actual crew or labour costs of operation. And um, yes, if you can sort of bring that under control, you're, you're well on the way to financial happiness. If we don't have that many car crews anymore, it would rise to a maximum of about 11. Even the likes of, of, of Mr. Farragut, uh, superintendent engineer, he certainly drives. Um, and when in fact there was a sort of major crisis, that I think the buses had gone out on strike again. Um, and it was the day of the Ramsey Sprint. Buses at that stage had decided they would go out on lightning strike with a moment's notice. Uh, we saw this great army of people coming down the promenade towards Derby Castle. Uh, there was a massive turnout like you'd never believe. There was about nine cars dispatched in about half, well, what, three quarters of an hour, um, all the way through to Ramsey. Now, that included Mr. Farragher, the superintendent engineer, Mr. George Lawson, the assistant engineer. Everybody who could drive simply grabbed the tram car and went. And it was very, very effectively handled, I'll tell you. Malarak Crossing precedes the most spectacular section of the line as the railway skirts Bulgham Bay. Today's formation is slightly inland of the original, or to put it another way, the Manx Electric Company decided that a railway built on solid rock would be preferable. Part of the original was supported above the drop by brackets. More of the cliff was cut away to bring railway and road away from the brink. The section of concrete wall on the right indicates that their fears were justified but this is the site of the 1967 collapse. By 1965, the 1903 formation was in trouble, the company observing with concern a bulge in the dry stone embankment. On January the 20th, 1967, shortly after services had passed each way, the Bulgum bulge collapsed. Cars 7 and 21 were stranded. Until July the 10th, services were terminated each side of the gap. 
passengers from the adjacent road to join another tram and continue their journey. The timetable was reworked to facilitate connection. An Italian technique was employed by specialist contractors from the Delay Foundations Limited. 116 three-inch concrete piles, interlocking precast units and liquid grout under high pressure were used to effectively weld the cliff together. We're now approaching Summit Curve, Balarak Top. The actual summit is halfway around the curve between posts 515 and 516. From here, it's predominantly downgrade for the remaining seven miles to Ramsey. From the air, we view number two and trailer 37. On the MER, conductors issue all tickets except to passengers who board at major stations. No doubt they are amused by visitors' attempts at pronunciation. In fairness, Manx place names aren't consistent. For instance, many places end with the letters GH, but they can be pronounced with a K or an F, such as Balarak and Balaf. To our right is Doon Glen, served by an MER station and also a hotel until 1932. I don't remember Doon Glen being promoted at anything like the level uh, that, say, Balaglass and Garwick was. Um, quite why, I don't know, because again, Doon Glen was actually owned by the Max Electric Railway Company Limited. Um, the hotel didn't exist after it went on fire in otherwise unexplained circumstances. The story was that the innkeeper had already moved all his uh, furnishings and belongings to a barn higher up there. So what the story was, I never did find out. Uh, here we are, doomed land. That's a very nice little cafe they've got there, actually. The hotel was one of six owned by the company. The others were the Strathallan at Derby Castle, the station at Lexi, Bungalow, Thalterwill and Snaefell Summit hotels. The company's only hotel interest today is at the Summit, which has been leased out since the early 1980s. Car 22 departs. Manx Electric sold Doon Glen in 1953, along with Balaglass, to raise capital for the payment of debentures. By this stage, the company was in a dire financial state, the sale of assets keeping them afloat. The new owner of the Glen was the Isle of Man Forestry Board. Sometime earlier, the Highways Board had purchased the two Doon quarries from the railway. There was Doon proper, uh, which is the one you can see dead ahead of us now. Um, that was by far and away the bigger of the two, but there was also another one, Dune West, which actually lies the other side of the main road and was um, accessed by a little two-foot gauge tramway which ran in a little tunnel. And you can still see the mouth of the tunnel, the highways board have latterly converted it into a drain. Uh, but inside there it is a proper little tunnel. Now I candidly have spent quite a lot of time in Dune West Quarry, the other side of the main road there, looking for where that tunnel's supposed to come out, and I've never found it, but it must be there somewhere. The quarry itself is there these days flooded, but I mean the level of the lake, as it were, goes up and down, so it must feed out somewhere. Stone from the quarry on the seaward side of the line was transported by an aerial ropeway to reception sidings on the electric railway. Two-foot gauge tracks were in use in both quarries. There were once sidings on both sides of the line. All of the loading apparatus has since... The water tank was installed to service lock on its trips from Lexi, initially as the star attraction of the MER's centenary year. Bruce had leased the 53-acre Doom quarry from October 1895, using the stone to pave the Upper Douglas Cable Tramway. 
The expansion of the site led to sets being exported to the mainland. And with this in mind, an extension to Ramsey Quay was amongst early plans for the Ramsey Line. We can only speculate how the railway would have developed if Dumbbell's Bank hadn't fallen. The quarry was lost during liquidation of the electric power company, but was purchased by the MER in 1903. The railway would sell stone to anybody. The stone that came out of Doom uh, was usually a, a, a granite. Um, and that was used for all kinds of purposes, including making road foundations. Um, so in the siege of your own destruction, you might say. Um, Balajora also was another MER quarry, and that was uh, Manx Slate, uh, fairly hard form, but it was used for building purposes and was therefore sold to anybody who wanted to build a house anywhere. Originally, stone from the quarries would have been carried in four-wheel open wagons, some of which were previously used during construction of the line. The largest vehicles were dreadnoughts, 12-ton stone wagons, mounted on Milne's bogies made redundant by the re-equipment program. Freight movement was limited by braking capacity rather than hauling power. Regular haulage of more than two of the bogie wagons is thought to be unlikely. Locomotive number 23 was usually used for quarry work, but its accident in 1914, in which at least two of the Bonner wagons are thought to have met their demise, resulted in a decade in store. The rebuild featured new frames with the bodies of two six-ton open wagons sandwiching the original cab. Initially, the railway did not want to carry freight, but Tinwald insisted that a service should be offered, realizing that the construction of this railway would effectively end speculation for a steam route up the east coast. We are now 11 and a half miles from Derby Castle. North of Bolgham, the scenery is notably different, the railway passing through a series of wooded valleys rather than assault the high ground. The route crosses glens at Doon, Glenmona and Ballaglass, an attraction for MER passengers even this far from Douglas. A handful of small communities are scattered over the farmland, but they were hardly likely to make any railway promoter prosperous. Corbyn's Crossing, middle of nowhere. Car 22 approaches. In September 1990, it was burnt down to the underframe at the Derby Castle car sheds after a resistance in the Ramsey end had overheated. McCard's joinery in Port Erin rebuilt the car in traditional style. Jones is crossing. Not really a stop at all. Then Glen Mona. A letterbox was once installed beside the original shelter. It was the very last to be emptied by an MER member of staff. By 1975, just three boxes were under contract, all north of Lexi. The one mail run was performed by the conductor on the 11.50 service from Ramsey every weekday morning. A Royal Mail van would meet the tram car at Laxey, the single bag of mail continuing its journey by road. Between the running lines are feeder boxes positioned at approximately half-mile intervals, although today not all are in service. Feeder point 25 is just beyond Glen Mona. The feeder serves the trolley wires which incorporate an isolating brake at feeder points, thus enabling the juice to be switched off. Inside the boxes is a series of knife switches and terminals. Northbound and southbound wires either side of the traction pole can be selected to isolate a section. The return circuit is via the rails and underground cables. So there's two conductor wires for the trolley and the third one up in the middle is the feeder wire. Well, um, you can actually pull that if, if the need really arose, but it's, it's very heavily oxidised. Um, the, the firework effect you'd get would be significant. Here you've got Balagori sub and all you've got is the wires coming in. Um, you've got a section gap of feeder ears that bring the power into the wire. 
um, and you just make sure that if at all possible, as your trolley head passes under that insulator, um, your power is actually off, as indeed it was. An unlikely location to stop? Watson's Crossing serves a local farm. Balagori substation was installed in 1989 to replace the sub at Balaglass, which was housed in the old power station, a building that had become completely disproportionate to the size of the equipment. The new sub contains 300 kilowatt solid state equipment, the old plant having served since the 1st of May 1935, when a direct AC public supply served new transformers and mercury arc rectifiers. Previously, AC power was supplied by Lexi power station via overhead lines. Spectacular results would have resulted from the AC feeder being mistaken for the trolley wire. Passengers may catch a glimpse of the former power station through the trees on the left. In the early days of nationalization, the building was sold off, but they continued to use that part of it which included their sub. Legend has it that technically the new owner inherited the railway's electrical equipment. But thankfully, this proved not to be a problem, even though a mercury arc rectifier would make a very intriguing ornament. Now here we are at Balaglass Glen, which should be 55 minutes out of Douglas, and we are exactly 55. Balaglass is one of 17 Manx National Glens, the tumbling coronary stream being bridged by the railway. The glen provided the inspiration for, among others, Manx poet T.E. Brown and local novelist Sir Hall Kane. Even at the height of Manx tourism, the glen was subject to little commercialism, a small cafe providing light refreshments. Even the Isle of Man Railway, predecessors of today's steam railway, included Balagla a list of essential places to visit. But needless to say, they encouraged you to use their own bus services, not the MER. Upstream, the colony served the railway's power station, but the plans for a turbine plant were never implemented. The building is now a private residence. Opened in conjunction with the Ramsey extension, coal was delivered from Ramsey by rail. A chute on the embankment led to the coal store. Two Galloway boilers provided steam for two Rob Armstrong tandem compound engines coupled to generators linked to a battery house. From 1903, 7 kilovolts AC from Laxey was rectified to DC by rotary converters, the steam plant only being used at peak periods. The 260 cell battery house remained active providing a cushion between the amount of current that could be generated at any one time and the peak demands. We continue our journey to Ramsey. Car 20 approaches in April 1995. Trailers are only used during the busier summer months or for special events out of season. Now, sad thing there, there's an enormous sort of 70 foot diameter bridge span underneath there, which nobody ever gets to see. Unless you actually physically get off, walk down that path into the glen and walk up in the middle of the river to look at it, you can never see that bridge. You spend a tremendous amount of time and money making it. To our right is the wooded glen. The line is heading east to avoid North Barun, a peak over 1,800 feet high. Soon a curve at Cornet, one of the sharpest on the line, will redirect the railway southeast, the line skirting foothills before once again curving north across Mackold Head. We're already in the parish of Mackold, the saint of that name being credited with the creation of the island's parishes. We're just starting the descent to Cornet now. You try to adjust your speed to suit what lies ahead of you. 
And so the essence is, I don't think you'd find half a pound of air down in that brake. So the wheels are just being rubbed by the brake shoes just to keep a finger down her collar, that's all. And you see from this side it's not that bad, at least you get some idea of what's going to come. It's not so bad if you're running northbound, but if you're coming from uh, Ramsey, uh, it is a very, very bad crossing back. The thing is, we know them. And uh, you really are ready and waiting for Mr. Lunatic Motorist to do something insane. And you're really disappointed. We're now well away from the main Douglas to Ramsey Road, and thankfully the crossings are generally quiet. The angle of approach of some roads offers poor visibility for motorists. Groudle, South Cape and Cornet are particularly tricky, a reflection of when the line was built. Then the railway was the important transport artery and the roads were an inconvenience. The tables have certainly turned in the eyes of the average motorist. North Barul and the trees in Ballaglass Glen form the backdrop at Crocreen Crossing. Number 2 and trailer 37 climb at 1 in 55. This pair is among the most prized possessions in the fleet, number 37 being one of the earliest trailers, still largely unrebuilt, which can operate reliably. Driving the special Google. You get to know all the sort of natural inhabitants of this line and its hedgerows. Now there's a, a couple of pheasants. Further back there, there's a blue peacock lives. And then there's stuff here, strangely enough. There's a sort of gingery tabby cat lives by itself quite wild you can sometimes see it walking up and down it knows where the trams run like most of the rabbits do for that matter and um, so it just sits there and lets you go past we assume that's what they call root knowledge it's not unknown for locals to ask motormen to look out for their lost pets perhaps it's the personal touch that really gives the manx electric its charm The trailer in our aerial sequences is believed to be number 20 when delivered in 1894. But as the power car fleet expanded, the early trailers were all renumbered. It was one of six delivered for the extension to Lexi, along with the six tunnel cars. The new trailers were the first to be built with roofs, although the original open toast tracks were to receive light canvas roofs in the same year. Originally, the plan was to haul two trailers with each power car, but with just two motors, this was soon dismissed. At the end of 1894, the fleet was nine cars and 12 trailers. Was optimism still lingering? Four of the 1894 trailers were lost in the fire at Laxey. 37 is used reasonably regularly, but 36 has been in store for some years. Saloon 19 hauls trailer 48 through Balafail. Both vehicles were delivered for the new extension to Ramsey in 1899. This is Balafail Karouche. Uh, in fact, it's the residence of the uh, present president of Timwall. Uh, for very many years, Speaker of the House of Keys. And in fact, I think the longest serving speaker of any government assembly anywhere in the Commonwealth, uh, Sir Charles Carouche, a great friend of this line too. Now you're on the descent to Balladjora, there's just this little Rome's crossing in the middle of it. Many of the crossings have austerity looking accommodation, very useful in the winter months, but surprisingly not necessarily supplied by the railway. 
that was locally put up. It's not one of ours. We painted and it fell over on the line once in a blizzard. So it was propped up and put together again and painted and it's been there ever since. The car is now heading directly north. The view to the right includes Mackold Head with its lighthouse. Mackold was named after the former Irish freebooter who was said to have seen the error of his ways and, as penance, fettered himself and set himself adrift in a small wicker boat. Eventually, he was cast upon the headland. Balajora is a regular stop. Just beyond here, an ancient piece of MER history has been rediscovered. There was a chap on the car one day um, who was explaining that when he was a, a youth some 65 years ago, um, the tram track was still in position in Balajora Quarry. And um, he suggested that he could never remember them having been lifted. So a week or so later, uh, I went up there with a, a shovel and started digging around. And sure enough, there they still were. And so that was the signal for a whole host of us to go up and actually clear all this lot. It was as exciting as uh, Professor Carter and Tutankhamun's tomb. There was a line climbed up along the side here, went under that loading gantry. Uh, they just tip the stone into the uh, MER wagons off the two-foot gauge line. A path behind the shelter at Dreams Carry gives access to the quarry. The newly unearthed Balajora quarry was opened to the public during the 1994 Summer Spectacular. It seems that the quest for railways on the Isle of Man has become something of a national pastime. Midlander Trevor Noll has taken up the gauntlet to find 56 railways to date, July 1995. Balajora was heavily used during the first days of the MER company when the new owners decided that ballast would be a good idea. No serious attempt had been made to ballast until 1900, and that was a pretty tardy job, between Douglas and Laxey alone, 20,000 tonnes of stone was needed to relieve the crisis. Two-foot gauge rails lead to a dock where the MER's mainline fleet of wagons were loaded. The three-foot gauge rails are still in situ, but the sleepers have collapsed. A trailing crossover with a head shunt was installed to give access from the main line. From the air, the tree-filled workings are barely discernible. As one of the oldest electric vehicles still in regular operation, it's hardly surprising that car two has received some modifications over the years. Most were implemented in its first decade. Trolley poles were adopted in 1898, after developments elsewhere encouraged the abandonment of even the modified bow collectors. The Ramsey extension was built for trolley operation. Number two, still going strong after 102 years service, approaches Dreams Carry Farm. 92 years earlier, the new management brought with it sweeping changes. On the track, with promotion, electricity generation, and even to the original trio of cars. Brush bogies evicted Milne's trucks, air brakes were fitted, four Belgian-built motors replaced the original Manchester pair, and the experimental Mather and Platt control equipment was discarded. The MER standardizing on the wares of the American giant General Electric. The section of line between Dreams Kerry and Lake is the longest on the route, although this might not have been the case. Just beyond Dreams Kerry Farm, the proposed sea level route into Ramsey was to diverge to the right, pass to the east of Lake, sweep west of Port Ivallon, and join the coast at Port Lake as seen in our opening section. Potentially a spectacular route. Ahead is Lake Crossing, 
the community is gradually becoming a suburb of Ramsey. The present shelter was erected after its predecessor was demolished in 1986. Each year, trips north of Laxey for cars one and two can usually be counted on one hand. The best day to find them in Ramsey is invariably the occasion of the Ramsey motorcycle sprint, when time trials are held in Moorock Estate as part of TT Fortnight. A varied programme of events is offered every summer, but major promotion of the railways is relatively new. Centenaries offer a convenient excuse. Between 1993 and 95, the MER and Snaefell lines benefited. 1996 is centenary year for the Groudle Glen Railway, the Upper Douglas Cable Tramway, and the Standard Gauge Douglas Southern Electric Tramway. One car from each of the tram systems survives. But that's not all. Wedding on rails previously in use by the Douglas Southern along the Douglas Head Marine Drive. Purely serving the tourist industry between Douglas Head and Port Soderick, it was closed in 1939 at the outbreak of war and never reopened. Identification of these rails is reasonably easy. The foot was drilled to enable them to be riveted to steel sleepers. The sad thing was those were the only lengths of Douglas Head Rail we actually bought. But what was remaining was available in 1955-56. And the old MER company bought that lot and laid it. And because it had been out of use for as long as it had, the head of the rail was very pitted with corrosion. Now, you get that if you've got rail use for a very long time. It doesn't much matter. And the passage of traffic will smooth it down again. Anyway, I mean, they didn't like the roar it made, so they bought no more. And I, I find that rather sad, because it was obviously very, very good rail. We're now approaching Bellevue. A substation was provided here in 1934. Unlike Derby Castle, Groudle and the Mountain Sub, it has always been served direct from the public supply. Beside the level crossing, adjacent to the tram stop, was the most northerly of the letterboxes once serviced by the MER. When the post office received complaints concerning the non-delivery of mail, they quizzed conductors, only to find that collections had been withdrawn for some time. The sting in the tail being a swarm of wasps resident inside Bellevue letterbox. A fine view of the 2,300 foot long Queen's Pier heralds our approach to Ramsey. Soon we'll be descending at 1 in 55, the grade steepening to 1 in 27 towards Balul. At least three routes were proposed for the final section of line to Ramsey. Each time, difficulties with the town's commissioners resulted in other options being explored. In fairness, the town was prepared to financially assist with the sea level route, 100 feet below the line at this point. A rockfall confirms its geological inadequacies. Only from the air can the two schemes be viewed together. Another plan involved the MER taking over the rail service on the pier, but that idea went the way of most Ramsey plans. The pier tramway lasted until 1981, the structure closing completely ten years later. It escaped demolition, despite a contretemps in the 1990s when a boat collided with the now listed structure. On the right, gardens are on the site of the temporary car sheds at Belua, where the original servicing pit is just about discernible. It was only used for a year before the car shed and station building, once on the left-hand side, were moved into the centre of Ramsey as the northern section was completed. The 1,266-yard extension beyond here was somewhat short of the tramway company's desires. There were thoughts of linking up with the quay and the Manx Northern Station. Once again, the link to a steam railway would never be built. Shades of Douglas. This is Belua Viaduct. This is a rather nice structure, actually. But it's the only decent steel bridge on the line. Crossing Belua Glen was among difficulties which kept the tram cars out of Ramsey for almost a year. Ahead is Belua Road Crossing, 
a white repeater light informs motormen that the warning lights for road users are operating. A treadle before the crossing activates the lights beyond switches them off. The expense of the Ramsey extension set up as a separate undertaking had been completely underestimated. Bruce claimed the new line had cost £6,000 per mile to build, but the real cost was around £14,000. Soon it became apparent that the Ramsey line's earning power was inadequate even to recoup the money already spent on it. The Manx Northern Railway was destitute by 1897. Surely this should have aroused fears for the viability of the second railway to Ramsey. The overspent company was barely settled in Ramsey when, in early 1900, an English bank requested the return of a £65,000 loan from Dumbbells, who had secured it to service a loan for the extension company. In the aftermath, Dumbbells and the two separate tramway concerns fell, the original company having offered security on the new line. The tramway undertakings needed £150,000 to keep afloat, but attempts to raise this were fruitless, and potential new owners realized that the whole concern would be available at a knockdown price from the liquidator. Ahead is Walpole Road, where ornamental brackets grace the traction poles and Belgian grooved rail was installed to enable the railway to be built into the road. Today, the inner edge of the rail has collapsed, the tramway and road remaining separate. Since 1896, the tramway company's finances had been suspect. All dividends had been paid out of capital, not profits. As such, the tramway was receiving money through loans, debenture and ordinary shares to build and invest, but was actually using some of this capital to pay a dividend, giving the illusion of prosperity and instilling confidence in the new extension, which would surely have floundered had the true economic position of the company been made public knowledge. Was Alexander Bruce a crook or just an eternal optimist? Could revenue from the Ramsey opening really resurrect the company? The 1898 figures for the Ramsey line showed a profit of just £71, yet the main company paid a dividend despite being severely in debt. Perhaps these figures had encouraged the English bank to pull out. Now we always thought this section of the line was temporarily graded just to get it open for July 1899. Um, we always had the idea they were intending to come back and level this off completely. Because uh, you climb up quite a hill and then you drop down all these wiggles and whatnot. Um, and if you think about it, July 1899 to February 1900 was just six months. So they'd obviously gone, well, they went bankrupt in the February 1900 bit and none of this work ever got finished. An investigation into the affairs of the tramway led to five men being charged, although by November 1900, Bruce had passed away. The funeral of the former Darling of Douglas was a low-key affair, although there were mumblings that the coffin was probably full of stones. Car 19 and trailer 40 arrive at Ramsey. The trailer dates from 1930, being one of three rebuilt from the charred remains of the Laxey fire. The three new bodies were built by the English Electric Company Limited in Preston, the work being funded by the insurance payout. Beyond Parsonage Road crossing is Journey's End. There you go, Royal Ramsey at last. Today's station at Ramsey dates from 1964, but the original goods shed survives and is in use as a Manx Electric Museum. When opened, the MER station and staff facilities were housed in the rear of the Palace Concert Hall, later the Plaza Cinema, its demolition in 1991 substantially changing the scene at the terminus. And so to bed. The last car of the day, the 6.15 arrival, departs for the car shed, having shunted its trailer ready for the 10 a.m. service. Shunts throughout the railway are regularly performed by gravity, the conductor and station staff giving the trailer a helping hand, enabling the power car to effectively run round.
The car shed was first used in 1898 at Ballour. Meanwhile, in Douglas, the ratchet car returns to Derby Castle car sheds at the end of the day. Car 18 sees little regular use. The historic value of no power brakes is genuinely appreciated by enthusiasts. But its lack of convenience for the motorman restricts its movements to special occasions. But when the sun goes down, it's not necessarily the end of the day. Car 9 arrives at Graudel in 1993. In over a hundred years' service, the MER has had a rocky history. The railway was a pioneer, but within ten years, technology had raced ahead. The new Manx Electric Company rejuvenating the archaic system. But again, one can't help wondering what might have happened without the fall of dumbbells. The purchase and electrification of the Manx Northern Railway? Electric trams along Douglas Promenade? Is the railway's charm the use of original wooden-bodied stock and no serious attempt at modernization since 1903? Or perhaps it's that and the people who keep it alive. Enjoy your next trip on the Manx Electric Railway. <laughs>